Well, thank you so much. That was a marvellous introduction. The only problem is now I have to live up to it. Uh, I was watching Dale's talk and I realised right near the beginning that I have the very same wizard's hat that Dale's son Connor had. But the only difference is I have the accent to go with it. Yes. And, and probably I still wear it, which I doubt, I doubt his son does. I'm James, I work with the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard and with the Humanist Community Project. And in case you don't know about us, uh, basically we're the arch accommodationists in this movement. We, we promote a very strong brand of faithism. We, we, our basic idea is to make the world safe for religious people by throwing the new atheists under the bus. That's basically <laughs> what we do. But we, we, we never met a faith position we couldn't find some way to respect or a religious belief we couldn't accommodate. Or at least I never met a religious boy I couldn't accommodate. <laughs> no, no, really. What we, what we do at the Humanist Community Project is try to bring together the collective wisdom of the free thought movement to help us build bigger, stronger local communities dedicated to humanist principles so that we can get involved in activism and change this country and change the world. That's what we're all about. Now, who was there at the Reason Rally? Oh, yeah, seriously. It was fantastic, wasn't it? I mean, it was amazing. Like, seriously, hats off to everyone who, who made that such a success. I was there at the Reason Rally. In fact, if you look really closely, um, <laughs> that's me. It's proof. I know you folks like evidence. So there it is. I was there standing in the pouring rain and the freezing cold, my leather jacket getting increasingly sod sodden and heavy on my shoulders as I was getting colder and colder, my testicles retracting into my body for warmth. I thought, honestly, I thought I'd never see them again. <laughs> Luckily, they were totally fine, you know, in full working condition. Just ask JT, he can vouch for that. <laughs> no, it was really fantastic. Although I was freezing cold, I had a fire inside. Because there was this great sense that fantastic work lies ahead of us for this movement. There are great challenges to overcome and that we might be able to meet. I believe that now is the time to build a real secular political and social movement, a counterweight to the religious right that works on the sort of issues that we've been discussing this weekend. The attacks on public education, trying to get money to religious schools through vouchers programs, the insidious attempts to sneak creationism into the classroom through ever more bizarre and dishonest ways. The continued struggle of those outside the established norms of sex, gender, and sexuality to gain equal recognition and respect in this society. The exclusion of atheists from the public discussion and from political office. All these issues, a large, engaged, humanist social movement could improve. But it's not just going to happen because people become non-religious. And that's really the core message of my talk today. Susan Jacoby, fantastic writer, if you haven't read her book, Free Thinkers, you must. It's a fantastic book on the history of free thinking in America. Wrote in her last column for the Washington Post in December of last year, looking back on my five years as a contributor to On Faith, I see a great paradox in the progress of American secularism. The numbers and visibility of atheists and secularists in the United States have increased, but their political and social influence has not. And I think that's broadly true. We're seeing an increase in numbers of people joining secular student associations and engaging in the movement, coming to um, <coughs> conferences like this. But we're not making the social impact that we should be making, given our numbers. And in fact, on some of the issues that we care most deeply about, I fear we're moving backwards. On abortion, the topic that we started this conference with, the polls recently from the Guttmacher Institute and the Public Religion Research Institute show that young people today are less supportive of reproductive rights than their parents. Only 33% of those 28 and younger support abortion compared to 40% of those aged 29 to 43. Contraception is suddenly on the table of political discussion with serious presidential candidates. I'm not sure whether they're serious presidential candidates, but potential presidential candidates talking about abolishing planned parenthood and about uh, how the sexual libertine idea is destroying this country. Contraception, really, are we, are we talking about that? 
and the continued erosion of the protective barrier between church and state, which I saw firsthand when I was down in Rhode Island at one of the hearings with Jessica Alquist, where I saw a room as big as this, filled with hundreds of people, the vast majority of which hated the idea of secularism and genuinely want to live in a Christian theocracy. In some of our issues, we're not only not making progress, we're moving backwards. And so I think there are two things that I'm gonna suggest that we can do about this to fashion what is currently an identity movement of atheists into a social and political movement of humanists. Firstly, we need to convert more people to our side, not just to be non-religious, but to be actively supportive of a set of humanist principles. And secondly, we need to activate those people to get more involved and to give ideas about how we can do that, conversion and activation. I want to dig into free thought history because I'm a huge geek when it comes to free thought history. I love the history of this movement, and I think we should talk about it way more often. And I'm gonna say, basically, that the nuns, the religious nuns, who we're talking about often, are an opportunity for us to recruit, but they're not an achievement. Most of them are not us yet. Most of them, in most studies, still believe in God, they say. And many of them, some 30% of them, move into and out of religious affiliation, depending on where you ask them. So those numbers hide a big problem. The increase in religious nuns is not necessarily increase engagement in our free thinking movement. So the nuns are an opportunity, not an achievement. We need to convert them and we need to activate them. And I'm gonna talk about two titans of free thinking history today. Think of ideas about how we might do this. Robert Ingersoll and Felix Adler. And I'm gonna talk about Ingersoll's voice and Adler's vision. And I thought that my talk wouldn't be complete a uh, proper philosophical talk without some subscripts. So I put them in. I do like them so. Um, so who is Robert Ingersoll? Who here has heard of Robert Ingersoll? That's a, a good number. Who here has read a lot of what he's written? Very few, okay? So this is really important to engage with this man and to see what he can teach us about free thought activism. Robert Ingersoll was known as the great agnostic. He was one of the best known public speakers of the 19th century. He was a hugely gifted orator and a stalwart champion of an early form of modern humanism. He supported women's rights, children's rights, civil rights, decades before they were mainstream progressive causes. And indeed, there is apparently, I'm told, an Ingersoll Street here in Madison. And today, he's remembered, remembered mainly as a religious critic. But I want to talk about his political writing, which is slightly less well known, because I believe here, is some of the great insights we can draw for our own activism today. And the lesson I'm gonna say we're gonna learn from Ingersoll is to speak the language of values. We need to learn better to speak the language of values. Because we're a community ultimately brought together by much more than the rejection of God. We are brought together by a shared commitment to a common set of principles, that truth is preferable to falsehood, that reason should guide public policy, not superstition that every person is worthy of equal dignity and moral concern, that we can, if we work together and use our intellect, make a difference in the world. The values of reason, compassion, hope that I think underlie the humanist worldview. And Susan Jacoby, writing again in that same column, outlined the problem that I think we need to solve by listening to Ingersoll. She said, since the 1980s, the far right, especially the religious right, has been masterful at taking control of public language in a way that always places secularism and secular liberalism on the defensive. We must reclaim the language of passion and emotion from the religious right, which loves to portray atheists as bloodless, professorial devotees of abstract scientific principles that have nothing to do with real human lives. And Ingersoll is a great guide to how we can reclaim that language of values. But I don't just want to go by the fact that Ingersoll did it and he seemed to be successful. I want to look at the evidence. And a huge weight of scientific evidence is now developing in books like The Political Brain by Drew Weston, The Sentimental Citizen, Campaign for Hearts and Minds, that people's um, political decision making is based on values. It's not really based on a rational assessment of the utility of different policies as some, uh, uh, some believe. But in fact, it's gut-level responses, primarily, to appeals to certain values. And I think if we harness this research and look at what Ingersoll did, we'll be more effective in converting people to our cause. So one thing we might draw from this is to say that whenever we tell someone what we don't believe, which is extremely important, 
don't believe in God, don't believe in superstition. Make sure we also at the same time tell people what we do believe. We do believe in reason, in evidence, in compassion, in hope for the future. Or in other words, make our values explicit. But what values? What values should we be talking about? What values should we be appealing to? Which values really get people in their gut to support a social movement? Well, psychologist Jonathan Haidt has done a huge amount of experimental research into people's moral decision-making that he outlines in this um, new book, The Righteous Mind. And he found that people's moral judgments are strongly informed by intuitive responses to six moral taste receptors. He talks about morality as basically like a tongue and says that our moral cravings are similar to our cravings for food. And here are the six uh, moral tastes that he talks about. Care and harm, the idea that we dislike it when we see harm being done to people instinctively. We don't need a reason to dislike it, we just dislike it. Fairness, we don't like it when something is unfair in some way. We don't like disloyalty to a group that we're a member of, that we feel a member of. We are very sensitive to disrespect to legitimate authorities, people we consider to be authority figures, we don't like disrespecting them. There's this idea of purity and sanctity that human beings tend to create ideas, practices, ideals that they put on a pedestal and they don't like to see those ideas traduced in any way, to be made impure. And we don't like it situations where people's liberty is infringed, where people are oppressed. Those are what he calls the six moral taste buds. And he also finds in his research something quite fascinating to me, that different people have different levels of sensitivity to these different moral tastes. So he says that liberals, generally, are really sensitive to one, two, and six. They're very sensitive to harm done to people, to unfairness, and to oppression. But conservatives, people who identify as politically conservative, are also very sensitive, in addition to those three, to disloyalty, to disrespect to authority, and to some pure or sacred idea being brought low. And I wondered whether I could find in Ingersoll's speeches evidence of him speaking to these six moral foundations. And I did. Ingersoll was a master at speaking to the six moral foundations that underlie our moral intuitions. And I'm going to highlight that through some quotes from one of his best speeches in my mind called The Liberty of All, or The Liberty of Man, Woman, and Child. Firstly, as you might expect from someone who's broadly progressive, he hits one, two, and six, the sort of liberal moral foundations, very hard. Hitting the harm foundation, he says this, speaking of corporal punishment of children. I do not believe in the government of the lash. If any one of you ever expects to whip your children again, I want you to have a photograph of yourself taken when you're in the act, with your face red with vulgar anger, and the face of the little child with eyes swimming in tears, and the little chin dimpled with fear, like a piece of water struck by a sudden cold wind. Have that picture taken. If that little child should die, I cannot think of a sweeter way to spend an autumn afternoon than to go out to the cemetery when the maples are clad in tender gold and little scarlet runners are coming, like little poems of regret from the sad heart of the earth. And sit down on the grave and look at that photograph and think of the flesh, now dust, that you beat. I tell you it is wrong. It is no way to raise children. He whacks that moral intuition, the harm to things, particularly to uh, people who can't defend themselves like little children, is deeply wrong. He whacks that out of the park with his extraordinary evocative sense of imagery about the harm caused to young children. He also hits the Liberty Autonomy Foundation. His whole speech is dedicated to liberty, the liberty of man, woman, and child. He says, hypocrisy and tyranny, two vultures, have fed upon the liberties of man. From all these there has been and is but one means of escape, intellectual development. Upon the back of industry has been the whip. Upon the brain have been the fetters of superstition. Nothing has been left undone by the enemies of freedom. Every art and artifice, every cruelty and outrage has been practiced and perpetrated to destroy the rights of man. I apologize for the sexist language he was writing in the 19th century. Um, 
So hitting that liberty oppression uh, taste bud really, really hard. And he also hits fairness. When he's speaking of raising children in this speech, he says, make your home happy. Be honest with them. Divide fairly with them in everything. Don't treat your children like orthodox posts to be set in a row. Treat them like trees that need light and air. Be fair and honest with them. Give them a chance. Be honest with them. Be just. Be tender. And they will make you rich in love and joy. So he hits, as you might expect from progressive, the care, harm, the fairness, and the liberty oppression foundations of our morality. But he also appeals to conservative minds by hitting those other three foundations in really quite striking ways. He appeals, although he was not a Christian, a strong um, uh, opponent of the Christian church, he appeals to the authority of Jesus because he knows his audience considers that a relevant authority and he wants to reach and convert them. And so in his argument against corporal punishment, he says, I have seen some people who acted as though they thought that when the Savior said, suffer little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, he had a rawhide under his mantle and made that remark simply to get the children within striking distance. So he basically says, Jesus wouldn't like what you are doing, drawing on the authority of Jesus to activate their moral emotions. He draws on the purity and sanctity framework, one that's very difficult for us um, secularists and free thinkers to draw, using this evocative image when talking about the evils of slavery, which he describes as a stain, essentially, on the purity of the Christian church. Think how long we clung to the Institute of Human Slavery, how long lashes upon the naked back were a legal tender for labor performed. Think of it. The pulpit of this country deliberately and willingly for a hundred years turned the cross of Christ into a whipping post. Taking that sacred image of the cross of Christ and showing how it's being desecrated, being made impure by their actions. And he spoke to loyalty. Repeatedly in his speech, Ingersoll's characteristic of loyalty to the highest principles of the United States is expressed with references to the flag, to those who have died for the country, and even a little digression where he does appeal to Abraham Lincoln. So Ingersoll's moral messages, more than any modern humanist I know, rests on all six moral foundations that Jonathan Haidt identifies in his psychological research. And that, I suspect, was one of the reasons for his extraordinary success in drawing people to him. He was extraordinarily successful. And I think that if we take the same tack, we might be successful ourselves. But I'm not just willing to rely on the evidence or an analysis of Ingersoll's speech. I actually did this myself. Recently at a rally, Chris Christie, who knows Governor Chris Christie? He's a great guy, um, one of my favorites. He came to Massachusetts to raise money for Scott Brown. And we held a, a um, protest with my gay rights activist group that I work with. And I tried within the speech to write in a way that would activate these six moral foundations, because I wanted to see whether it would work. And the thing that we were protesting Chris Christie for primarily was his veto of the marriage equality bill in New Jersey. Basically, the legislature passed marriage equality, and he took a pen and he vetoed it. He said, no thanks. And during my speech, I summoned the ghost of James Madison, and I, I channeled Robert Ingersoll, and I, I drew on the authority of the Founding Fathers to make my case. I said that Madison would support it. I quoted from his Federalist Papers, things like that. Because I knew that many conservatives hold those ideas and images in high regard. So I drew on that authority. I called Christie an oath breaker. I said he'd broken the oath he made before his God when he was sworn in. I don't believe in God, but I know that much of my audience does. And it doesn't hurt me to reference the fact that they do and that there's an inconsistency in their beliefs that in a sense Christie was being disloyal to the group of which they're a member. And so I tweaked that sort of moral sense. And I said that when he vetoed the bill, he scrawled on the Constitution of New Jersey and on the Constitution of the United States. And I said that because I know that the Constitution is what um, Bella calls a civil religion in the United States, that these documents are sacred in the eyes of many Americans. And if I could show that that sacredness was being impugned in some way, people might be roused to moral action. And the response was kind of astonishing. The National Organization for Marriage, which is the primary anti-equal marriage group in the country, picked up my speech and put their video, the video of it on their website. 
and they said, this is so weird. A British guy who lives in Massachusetts lecturing the governor of New Jersey about the sacred rights of Americans, right? <laughs> they, thought, they thought this was very odd. And they weren't content with that. No, they sent out a newsletter to their entire membership called Redefining Our Sacred Values, in which they sent a video of my talk out, and they rebutted it point by point. And this is what they said at the beginning of that newsletter. What gay marriage advocates are now doing is trying to make gay marriage into a sacred value, something every American is bound to uphold. The broad and deep traditions of the American Republic are being co-opted into making a strange new god of gay marriage. This is an amazing process to watch unfold, the audacity of it, and in the end, the meanness of it. That's what they said. To which I reply, pretty much yeah. <laughs> that is exactly what I was trying to do. And they tasted it, and they didn't like what they tasted. They particularly tasted that sanctity foundation, that some sacred value was being appealed to. And they didn't like that it put them on the wrong side of the issue. It made them mad. And that suggests to me that we could do this more often and keep putting the religious right on the wrong side of their own issues. Let's retake the language of value and passion from the religious right and make it into our own. It might not work, but at least we'll piss off the religious right, which I think is a goal in itself. So that's the first suggestion. Speak the language of values. That's what we can learn from Ingersoll's voice. What can we learn from Felix Adler, from Adler's vision? Well, first, who was this guy? Most people probably haven't heard. Who has heard of Felix Adler in this room? Only very, very few of you, far few of you, that have learned, uh, heard about Ingersoll. And I think that points to a, to a problem. Because I think Adler, in the long run, may, may have been more significant. Felix Adler was a proto-humanist philosopher, orator, and activist, the son of a significant rabbi in New York. And at the age of 25, he founded what he called a new religion, called the Ethical Culture Society. But it was basically not a religion in the sense that we consider it today. It was a social group, a, a social activist group for humanists. Because when he made the founding address of this ethical culture society, people thought it was great. It hit all those moral foundations, and they thought it was exciting, and they were galvanized by it. But they did notice one significant lack, which is that God wasn't there. He basically excised God from the whole process of religious community building and said, we can have moral communities dedicated to social action without believing in God. That was his big insight. And so what I think we can learn from Adler's vision is we must build moral communities that bring together non-religious people in a very similar way to the way that churches bring together religious people, and then which engage them in social action and reinforce their values. And this is what, Inge, uh, what Adler said about that idea. That the custom of meeting together in public assembly for the consideration of the most serious, the most exalted topics of human interest is too vitally precious to be lost. He believed that churches fulfill a crucial social function, the generation of moral energy and political activism that the secular world should not lose. We need the churches, he said, or the substitutes for the church, as a hearth at which the spirit of charity may be kindled, in which the motives may be engendered that shall lead people to charitable action. Otherwise, these secular societies will become mechanical and formalistic to a degree. A system of electric transportation cannot be operated without power. There must be powerhouses in which the electric fluid is generated. So the church, or the institution that takes its place is designed to be a powerhouse in which the electric fluid that moves the world's charities shall be generated. To speak poetically, what Adler wanted to build were generators for the secular soul, like powerhouses in which we engage in community activism. And this is the house that he built. It's an enormous building on Central Park West, overlooking Central Park. It is the size of a whole city block. That whole thing is the building. It is five stories high, and inside of it, there is a 750-seat Art Nouveau uh, auditorium, all of which was built by proto-humanist activists in the 19th century, in an environment where this sort of religious experiment was much 
less well received than it might be today. This is an extraordinary success. This is the biggest piece of physical capital that the humanist movement owns in the world. And he built it with this tiny, really, movement that was only ever as big as about 6,000 people in the country that we think. They had huge social impact for such a small group of people. They founded the Ethical Culture School, which is one of the uh, premier pri private schools in the country now. It's that brown part of the building on the left. They founded the Visiting Nurse Association in New York, which still exists today, which is a home health and hospice care organization. They founded the Child Study Association, the first United States settlement house, and the Encampment for Citizenship, all organizations that were central to the progressive movement in the United States. And ethical culture leaders helped establish the Legal Aid Society, the NAACP, the ACLU, and the New York Committee to Abolish Capital Punishment. They had enormous social impact for such a small group of proto-humanists. How did they achieve that? They achieved that because they understood that people's moral energy is generated and reinforced in community with other people. Answering the question of how it's possible to get non-religious people engaged in social activism, Adler said, how is it possible to induce people to make the effort, there being no authority or book or creed to lean upon? The answer to that is that the method we must pursue is to put people in the midst of crowds. His idea was that by putting people in a moral community of individuals who shared their values, you would create a reinforcing effect, get people more committed to those values and more committed to actually doing something about it. Basically, he said we need institutions that act at the top level of that diagram, supporting broad values like a commitment to reason or a commitment to compassion, and that that commitment to broad values will trickle down eventually into engagement in specific social issues. But if we just had secular societies working on um, school reform, college zone, science funding, things like that, it would become an atomized landscape in which people spread their efforts thinly across competing charities with no cohesive moral narrative to bring them together. And I think that's exactly what has happened in the secular world today. This is precisely one of the reasons why progressive uh, politics is so difficult to achieve its aims. So he thought that something needed to exist at the top of that pyramid to generate people's moral energy. And just as Ingersoll was prescient, um, sort of foregrounding uh, the um, Jonathan Haidt's uh, arguments about moral uh, foundations, Adler was prescient too, because we've discovered since then, uh, and this is the book that I would tell you to investigate if you want to find out about this, that religious people do indeed engage more in their communities than non-religious people. They give more money to charity, they volunteer more of their time, they run for office more, they vote more often, but not because they are religious believers. All those positive civic engagement practices are correlated not to religious belief, but to engagement in a religious community. And that's why I believe we need to learn from Adler's vision and build moral communities of humanists which will generate moral action in the same way. So to conclude, I believe we have an extraordinary opportunity to make change in the world, to make this country a place which is governed by reason, filled with compassion, and looks forward to the future in hope. If we can speak in Ingersoll's voice and pursue Adler's vision, we will change this country and we will change the world. And I don't know if there's time for any questions, but I suspect people will have them. So, so if you do have questions, let's see if we can squeeze a few in. Yeah, good.